Over this period of 35 years, the company grew from zero to 170 million in sales and became the leading company in both the picture frame industry and mirrors. From 1980 into the 90s, uh, we were doubling our size every two and a half to three years. As a result of foreign competition, our gross profit margins deteriorated we had to watch every penny of overhead. So here we are, we're mobilizing our resources very carefully, we're controlling costs, and the one area that was so confounding was healthcare costs. We would be faced with double-digit, sometimes high double-digit increases the premiums in total for healthcare costs has actually doubled over the last 10 years. That's an exorbitant increase. That's more than any other expense has increased over that same 10-year period. After years and years of incurring these significant cost increases, I started to look into healthcare. The one great thing about MCS is if there is a problem, we deal with it straight ahead. We investigate, we resolve, we fix. For an average family of four, this year's number is $23,000. That's what a typical American family ensured that way costs. And they have this false sense of security, that they're in a, a plan that provides them protection. But uh, regrettably, all too often, people find out when it's too late, after they've been sick, after they've been hospitalized or, or injured and, and requiring expensive treatment, that their coverage was not nearly what they thought it was. And insurance companies are able to charge older people uh, three times as much as younger people for the exact same policy. Their potential employer sees them as a risk. The age 50 to 64 age bracket includes very high rates of uninsurance within the U.S. market, and it's because these are very expensive employees. It makes it less likely that uh, employers will even consider hiring someone in their 50s, for example, or early 60s. I've talked to people who's, who's told me they've not gotten a raise in five years because the money they would otherwise have gotten uh, in raises has gone to insurance companies. We've created a very fragmented system in which coverage is tied to employment in ways it isn't in most other countries in the world. If you and your family lose their whole health insurance because of a change in your employment status, that's an incredible insecurity, an incredible burden for families to have to bear. So the whole idea of, of having insurance that protects us from financial ruin, it just doesn't exist anymore for most people. And this is why of a million bankruptcies in the United States, over 60% are associated with medical conditions. And the great majority of those are people who have health insurance. We went through years of working hard only to lose everything. Lose our home, go bankrupt. What a shameful thing to do to people. You see these numbers of people who don't have insurance and families who are driven to bankruptcy. If you talk to most families, they can identify at least one person in their family who's really struggled with health care issues and how to finance those issues. 40,000 unnecessary deaths every year because there's no health insurance. And these are real people who are suffering and who are dying. Of course, I had health insurance, but I never actually thought a whole lot about it. I paid the premiums. I wasn't using anything that much. My out-of-pocket expenses were pretty much nil. But then Bill got sick, and he was hospitalized. So all of a sudden, these bills started rolling in, and my insurance wasn't covering everything. In 2014, a family that was paying four to 5,000 as a premium share 
and MCS was paying 13 to 14,000 as their share of the coverage, that family could pay another six or $12,000 if one or two people got sick. We're up around $10,000 in expenses. What would happen if I would get sick? Our expenses would be probably up around $16,000 a year. That's unbelievable. If anything happens to me, that's, we're, we're, we're done. My father, uh, late in his life, was an over-the-road truck driver. He had some modest success and kind of went from one truck that he drove himself, buying a second and third truck, and ultimately having a couple of employees that drove for him. He had achieved, in, in some very modest and small way, late in his life, the success that I think he always had dreamed of. Unfortunately, he uh, suffered a really a kind of catastrophic uh, truck accident where his truck actually flipped over a guardrail and landed on the highway beneath him. I will never forget being there when he woke up in the ICU, and his immediate reaction was to try to rip the lines out of him and get out of there. And I said, you know, Dad, it's okay. You're in the hospital and you're in, you're in the ICU. It's going to be all right. And he said to me, no, you don't understand. He said, I can't afford this. I got to get out of here. And it bankrupted his company. So the two folks he had working for him didn't have a job anymore. Doing all the right things, playing by the rules, uh, working hard was all eliminated like that with one, with one accident. Every employer I know, and I'm talking about small to medium guys mostly, they dread the next hike in their insurance rates. So we've got people who fear they're gonna be put out of business if they have one employee or one spouse or one child that has some kind of a huge healthcare event. The current costs of the system are becoming intolerable. And as they become intolerable, their business naturally is going to look for other solutions. It distracts businesses from doing their primary function, precludes them being able to budget for hiring, for investment, for expanding their enterprise. Why are we creating an extra hurdle for business? It's tough enough out there. You know, why are we making it harder for people to provide goods and services to the American public while employing people and providing tax revenues? I often ask folks that I work with who own businesses, tell me one thing in your business that you spend, the kind of money you spend on health insurance that adds no value to your business. There's a middleman, an insurance company, that isn't improving your employees' health, that isn't saving you money, and that is not doing what's best in the best interest of our economy. Healthcare costs are going up two to two and a half percent above the projected growth of gross domestic product. So it is running away from us. Healthcare costs have gone up to three trillion dollars. We've gone from seven percent of the economy back in 1971, being healthcare, to 18% today. When the rest of the world is spending less than 10% of their economies and getting healthcare to all of their citizens. There's been a reduction in consumer purchasing power that can be directly associated to the increase in medical costs in the country. If you now have a $1,000, $2,000 deductible, that is money that is not available for you to get a new car. More disposable income to spend translates into more demand for the goods and services that employers are in business to produce and sell. In the city of Philadelphia, where school teachers are being laid off by the thousands, and where classroom sizes are escalating above 40 students per teacher. And you don't have proper security in schools. Children are being taught on the fourth and fifth floors of buildings that don't have air conditioning or proper heating. We are undermining our capacity to function, let alone compete as a society. 
because of the rising costs of health care. People don't realize that the huge federal deficit that we have in this country is related to the fact that we have this enormous health care cost bill. Part of the indirect cost of health care that most people are not aware of is that their taxes will continue to go up to pay for this broken health care system. We're here at the uh, Bethlehem Wastewater Treatment Plant here in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And this piece of equipment behind me is a 40-year-old piece of equipment that's been basically taken out of service. We've got a, a rental unit that we now pay $17,000 a month to lease that piece of equipment. So that $17,000 of additional cost monthly expense is gonna get passed on to the sewer customers in a form of, of rate increases. And this plant in general is just one small example of what the true impacts are of the spiraling costs of healthcare and our inability, whether it be here in the city or as a country, to address the infrastructure needs that we have throughout this country. I remember 35 years ago when healthcare was affordable. MCS had great insurance, full coverage with minimal deductibles. U.S. employers across the country provided well for their employees. No worries. That's all been eroded by a relentless increase in health care costs. Today, there's a dark cloud of anxiety in the country, a dark cloud over our employees. They're one diagnosis, one accident away from financial disaster. A few sick employees can take down a company. The dark cloud hangs over our cities. No money for infrastructure, no money for schools, high taxes. That dark cloud hangs over our whole economy, causing flat wages and no money to spend to fuel real growth. It's a problem that we have to solve. The U.S. has one of the shortest lengths of stays in hospitals of any country, and we're told we have to shorten it. We go to the doctor about 4.2 times a year. The Japanese go 13 times. So we're told that we use too much health care and we have to restrict access to save money, when in fact we're below average when it comes to comparable countries. The whole system is set up to discourage people from using health care. The insurance companies are specialists at figuring out ways of covering less or paying less the sicker you are. One of the reasons I left the industry was because I was uh, expected to be a cheerleader for consumer-driven plans uh, or plans which have high deductibles and to persuade the American public, employers in particular, uh, that everyone needed to have more skin in the game. What the companies were doing to meet Wall Street's financial expectations uh, was to make it less likely that people could get care that they needed, that they could afford insurance. And that's when I decided that I had to find some other way to earn a living. I was being paid, uh, in my view, uh, to mislead people, and I couldn't in good conscience keep doing that. Medicare, and they talk about that it's broken, that it's unaffordable, that the costs are escalating. And this is an enormous distortion of the reality of Medicare. In fact, Medicare has been a runaway success. Well, Medicare can take care of the uh, sickest and the oldest in our society, and they can do it actually at far less cost uh, than the private insurance companies could do. They don't have the same kind of cost that the, that the private insurance companies have. They don't spend enormous amounts of money on their sales and marketing teams and on advertising and they don't need to have an infrastructure in which uh, they're, they're going back and forth with healthcare providers on a daily basis to try to determine whether or not something is a covered benefit, which is also something that eats up uh, an enormous amount of their premium revenue. I was the administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. It runs both, those, both of those programs and the Children's Health Insurance Program. We had 5,500 employees in that system to cover the whole country. Our budget, the amount of money going out to the healthcare system, was about $820 billion a year, nearly a trillion dollars. Total overhead budget, that is the, the, the administrative budget that I had, was about $8 billion, 1% of the total. That probably undercounts, so let's make it 3%, 4% of the total budget. Right now, by policy in this country, under the Affordable Care Act, we are 
trying to argue insurance companies down to 15% overhead. The American taxpayers are saddled with the poorest in our society and the oldest and those who are with chronic disabilities and those on dialysis. And we're putting them in the government programs and saying all you healthy people from 18 to 64, we're gonna hand it over to private insurance companies. And still, even with doing that, Medicare manages to actually control healthcare costs better than the private insurance companies can. It's the system as a whole that creates the inefficiency. The fact that there are so many different payers and so many different plans and so many different ways in which bills have to be made and collected. So having multiple insurances and having multiple ways of even billing for that patient is adding to the inefficiencies of the patients. You look at quality and variability, they're opposite of one another. The more variability that you have, the more entities, provider, payer, insurance, manufacturers, and, and so on, the more chances of error, the more inefficiencies, the more cost. One of the reasons why hospital bills are so high, why we are charged so much by doctors, is because they have to spend uh, a lot of resources. They have to hire staff who do nothing more than engage in a nitpicking war with insurance companies on a daily basis to make sure that they are getting paid appropriately. It makes me angry to see so much waste in health care, that there are nurses who are pulled away from actually providing hands-on patient care, and they're pulled into administrative duties. And they're pulled into those duties because we have an incredibly complex billing system, we have many different payers in our billing system. We have people who can't pay, people who have this insurance, people who have that insurance. So there's nurses whose full-time job is to help get authorization so that a patient can get the care they need. And that's ridiculous. I would really love to be a nurse without having to think about whether or not a patient can get the care they need, whether or not a patient is sent home from the hospital without the proper medications because they can't afford it, whether or not a patient is going to be able to get a treatment that a doctor recommends because their insurance company won't pay for it and they can't afford it, and it does break your heart. Uh, we as a small practice of five doctors and one provider uh, deal with about 20 different insurance companies at this point. We have a middle office that has three people in it and an office manager that deal with essentially insurance issues and payment issues all the time. If I write a prescription and they want more information, my nurse has to call up that company, wait for their telephone system to come up with a live voice, give them the particulars of the patient and the medication, but it's not uncommon that they spend 30 minutes with one appeal. So we're trying to figure out the game so that we spend the least amount of time doing that kind of baloney. Every physician spends $84,000 a year just to interact with the private health insurance industry. Doctor wanted an MRI ordered. Patient was in excruciating pain, unable to walk. We attempted the MRI and we were told no. Patient had to have six weeks of physical therapy. He endured six weeks of physical therapy. His symptoms got worse, but in the meantime, he had five office visits, two ER visits, an admission, a transfer to another hospital, and finally a rehab hospital. And it just blew my mind that we could not get the MRI approved without six weeks of therapy when we had a person that could not walk. Uh, we deal with insurance companies all day long and we document every conversation we have, who we spoke with, when we spoke with them, because depending on who you get on the phone, you will get a different answer every time you call in. Um, if we did not have the staff that we did, we would not be questioning half of the claims that we do. It's very time consuming and it's extremely frustrating. So insurance companies increasingly are the force in the room, unseen but powerful. When you're in the hospital room, that's who is really driving a lot of the decisions that are made. How long you're going to be in the hospital, what drugs you're going to be given, what access to providers or tests that you have. Those things are increasingly driven by the insurance company reimbursement. MCS pays one and a half million dollars a year for its health insurance. And where does it go? 
Three cents of every dollar goes to an insurance agent that represents MCS in selecting an insurance plan and negotiating price. The next 20 cents of our premium dollar goes to the insurance company for its sales and marketing expense and for its staff to pre-approve and deny care and its administrative expense. And then you have at the provider level, 10 to 15 cents that goes to hospitals and doctors to interface with my insurance company. They face massive amounts of paperwork and phone time dealing with pre-approvals and denials and payment issues. None of it is related to care. That's 33 cents of our dollar before the actual cost of care is paid for. My insurance company is supposed to negotiate better prices from the providers but on average, they end up paying 20% more than Medicare does. They pass that extra cost on to my company. I don't see what private insurance brings to the table. What keeps insurance company CEOs up at night is the, the worry that other CEOs that, that will eventually come to realize that they, they add more cost than value to our healthcare system. And that more and more uh, employers, corporate executives are beginning to, to understand that. When you have a publicly accountable system, as we could have a single payer, you can have less confusion. Over and over again, we're hearing the same plea. The system is too confusing. We need to have simplification to control cost and to improve quality. And what about single payer health insurance? What does it mean? We get rid of the hundreds of complicated insurance plans and we have one comprehensive plan that covers everybody. It's simple and efficient. You go to any doctor or any hospital you want, present a card and you're covered. There are no deductibles, no out-of-pocket expenses and no contentious pre-approval before treatment. Everybody is covered. Nobody is left out. Single payer is not a government takeover of health care. The doctors and hospitals remain totally independent, just like they are with Medicare. If I told you that every one of your employees could get the health care they need guaranteed, that your costs would go down, everyone would pay less and get more, you might be skeptical. But the truth is, most every country in the world does that. The benefits in Taiwan's single-payer system are comprehensive. You have inpatient care, hospitalizations, uh, visits to doctors, drugs, dental care, pre-child uh, delivery, dialysis, all of that is paid for. Patients have complete freedom of choice of providers. Taiwan spends 1.6% of its total operating budget on administration. And that is a tiny fraction of what we spend in this country. It's the peace of mind that it gives people, which Americans don't have yet. I hope every American has that someday. Our current broken healthcare system is the most rationed healthcare system in the world. That's why a third of Americans don't get the healthcare they need. The idea that you can have high deductible policies and that you're not rationing healthcare by income class, I would say, where were you educated? That isn't even requiring a PhD, that's just common sense. Think of a waitress making 30,000 and you ask her to cough up 10,000 out of pocket. One of the biggest differences between the United States and the rest of the world Studies by the Commonwealth Fund and others find Americans are much, much more likely than people in other countries to defer medical care because of cost. We have a large number of people dying from causes that should be preventable. So when one takes all these causes of death, which one should not die from, given access to appropriate and effective medical care, 
the U.S. comes out as number 19 compared to France, which in fact is number one, or Australia, which is number two. The data shows very compelling information about single-payer systems. And so it was imperative that we visit a single-payer system and experience what life was like on the ground. Fortunately, we've got a single-payer system operating to our north in Canada. I found that I was really quite unencumbered when it came to seeing the patients, that I could concentrate on doing medicine and not worry about other things. And that was quite a change from what my experience had been. And then I worked in community health centers in Oakland, California for many years. I was the medical director there and the medical director also of a consortium of community health centers also in the East Bay area. I left there in 2004 and moved to Canada. Sometimes when I'm driving around here, I think, oh my gosh, you know, I'm back in a Marcus Welby episode or something. First family practice department meeting that I attended here in Canada was quite an experience. People actually seemed happy. No one was talking about the latest outrage that had occurred from some insurance company. No one was complaining that they couldn't see their patients anymore. As a Canadian physician, I sort of laugh when I hear people talk about government, you know, telling me what to do or government-run health care. That's certainly not been my experience uh, of working in the Canadian health care system. I, I have a, an enormous degree of clinical autonomy. People seem to think that because there's a single payer, that you are working for the government. Okay. You're an employee. They tell you what to do. Nothing could be further from the truth. Let's just take a listen and see how blood pressure's doing today. I'm in practice, I'm a small business person. They're not running my business for me. They don't come in and review me and tell me, you're not doing this right, you're not doing that right. They're the ones that pay me for the work that I do. This is what I do to bill for one patient. I bring up the patient, click on you, type in the codes, billing item and a diagnosis code. The date is already filled in for me. I create bill and it's done. It is very simple. You know, basically you come in, I see you, I send off a bill. Two weeks later, there's money in the bank. Patient doesn't have to pay. We are billing on behalf of the University Health Network for four hospitals for diagnostic tests to the Ministry of Health. We don't see any situations where the ministry is second-guessing the doctor's clinical decision on the test. We bill weekly, electronically, and there are approximately 10,000 claims on those weekly billings. And those are handled by approximately 10 people within the department. This uh, myth about Canadians dying on waiting list is simply that, it's a myth. When people have something really urgent that needs to be dealt with uh, in the Canadian healthcare system, it, it gets dealt with. The notion that having a single payer somehow causes wait times is not actually borne out by the international evidence on healthcare system design. We see healthcare systems internationally where it's a single payer system and there's virtually no wait time at all, Taiwan being a good example of that. We see systems that have multi-payers uh, where wait times have been a big problem. There's a lot of mythology out there that somehow there's a big tax burden or a big cost that comes along with the Canadian publicly funded model. In my 25 years as a cross-border tax consultant, I'd say I've prepared at least 5,000 U.S. returns and about the same amount, 5,000 Canadian returns. The surprising thing is that even though on an income of $50,000 the tax rates in Canada and the U.S. are about the same, in Canada that tax covers primary health care. In the U.S. there'd be additional cost to that person either through their own insurance or employer insurance. Canada now spends half as much per person as we do in the United States, yet their life expectancy has increased faster than ours.
I am Dan Conkin and I'm the president of Amco Manufacturers. We're a family owned business and been in business for over 47 years. I'm a member of the Conservative Party of Canada and we stand for removing waste, being more efficient and finding ways to grow our own businesses. And one of the greatest ways that we can grow our business is to reduce cost. And that's why we embrace the Canadian healthcare system. What I don't understand is why my fellow Conservatives in the United States tend to fight this. So my name is Terry Alexander and I work for Ampco Manufacturers and I've been an employee here for 17 years. From what I've experienced, the Canadian healthcare system is amazing. I've, I felt very well taken care of. I didn't feel like there was any treatment that was available that they weren't providing for me. Uh, my appointments were very quick. While I was going through my treatment of my surgery and the chemotherapy and the radiation therapy, it was absolutely exhausting and very stressful and lots of anxiety. If I had had the added burden of coming up with thousands of dollars for my health care coverage to fight this disease, it would have been devastating. It would have been horrible. When I hear that people say our Canadian system isn't good, it, it makes me a bit angry because I'm quite proud of our Canadian system. There are obviously far, far, far more stories in the U.S. about people who are not being able to get the care that they need than you'll ever find in Canada. Canadian hospitals and Canadian doctors have more bed days per thousand and more visits per capita than in the United States. We looked at opening up a U.S. operation. We wanted to be closer to our customer base. We wanted to be closer to our supply base. But the more we looked at it, the amount of cost that we would have incurred by having our company relocate into the United States just through the insurance coverage costs alone just made it a non-starter. If I had to increase my cost by over a million dollars in my company because of insurance coverage costs, that alone would probably drive me to bankruptcy. In fact, up here in Canada, the major American auto companies, Ford, General Motors and Chrysler, actually made a public declaration, a public statement, that the publicly funded healthcare system in Canada was an important competitive advantage for their operations in Canada. Labor negotiations are always a very contentious thing. And we hear about them today, particularly in the, in the public sector, in uh, state government, uh, municipal government, school districts, very contentious labor negotiations. And almost always one of those contentious issues is health care. If health care is no longer part of the bargaining process because it's now covered under a, a single-payer health care system, uh, that issue is off the table. And if you look at corporate interests, those usually associated with the right side of politics, the conservative side, their interests are enormously tied to reform of health care. As a business owner and, and also as a former uh, Republican legislator, I've said that conservatives should be supportive of single payer because it costs less. Talking with corporate executives, a lot of them I think get this. They know what waste is. They wouldn't be running successful companies if they tolerated waste in their production system and they can see the waste on the healthcare side. This crazy transactional system is costing them money without value. Business, when they look at the single payer model, will come quickly to the conclusion that it is the least expensive, the most supportive of a free market, and will have the most direct effect on their costs of operation. The cost of my company and its employees goes down with single payer. Instead of high insurance premiums with high deductibles, there's a simple payroll fee, like we pay for Social Security. My company gets out of the healthcare business. I did a study myself which, which estimated 34% waste in American healthcare. The National Academy of Sciences did a study that came between 30 and 40%. The Rand Corporation has a study, about 35%, I think it is. One out of three dollars wasted. One out of three of three trillion dollars is one trillion dollars of non-value added activity in care. It's hard to get that out with a multi-payer system. In every city, every day, there's people who pay 10,000, 20,000, and 40,000 for the same procedure. The doctor doesn't change their quality based on how much they're being paid. 
In Massachusetts, the Attorney General issued subpoenas to get this information. And what we found, even for people that are health policy experts and thought they understood this area, the variation in what hospitals are getting paid was more dramatic than we thought. How are the prices set? I'll wager you have no idea. And I don't think anybody does. This is a situation where nobody really knows what it costs and nobody really knows what's being billed because it varies all over the map. And what healthcare systems have learned is that they can charge whatever they want. So pretty soon you've got the MRI that costs $12,000 when in fact it may cost them $300 to provide. You see, there's no accountability. The buck doesn't stop anywhere. The system is not in control. With a single payer, there's more clout, there's more chance to push back, and to push back on prices, to say no to price increases and forms of pricing that just make no sense. The reason traditional Medicare has controlled prices better than the rest of the healthcare sector is because they've controlled hospital prices and physician rates. They don't pay just what people want. They pay according to a more reasonable schedule that's more equitable. The only place in the United States where you get drugs at Canadian prices, the Veterans Administration. The VA, using competitive bidding um, and a formulary list, gets lower prices, and they pay 41% less on average than does the rest of the United States. The reality is every study, including ones done by the Lewin Group, has found savings from single payer. There's not a single study that's ever been done that says single payer will cost more. Single payer makes economic sense. We save $198 billion by eliminating insurance administrative cost and profits. We save $242 billion by reducing the administrative cost to doctors and hospitals that no longer waste time and staff interacting with multiple insurance companies. We save $116 billion by establishing a fair, standardized fee schedule for hospitals and providers of care. We save $154 billion by negotiating bulk pricing on medical devices and drugs, like all other advanced industrialized countries. The total savings is $710 billion a year. The $710 billion in savings means we can lower the overall cost of healthcare. We can afford $77 billion to cover the uninsured and afford $129 billion to eliminate out-of-pocket expenses. It's about shifting resources from wasteful spending to actual care. You know, the great irony of all this is when somebody says, oh, can we afford single payer, is we can't afford the current system. The only thing we can afford is single payer, because single payer is the only way that we can bring costs under control and bring the rate of growth in healthcare costs to a rate sustainable over the long term. The national movement for single payer continues to expand, it continues to grow. There are well over 20 states that have solid organizations working on both national and state level single payer. It continues to uh, gain the support of Republicans as well as Democrats, business leaders as well as nonprofit leaders. It brings in educators, nurses, doctors. We've got constituents all the way across the board. What I would love to see is that policymakers could come to the table, park their ideology at the door, and just say, what we're going to do here is take a look at what makes the most sense for this country, what makes the most sense for our businesses, what makes the most sense for the people who work for those businesses and for others in this country, what makes the most sense in terms of of creating a healthcare system that really is the best in the world. Just imagine what it would mean for this country if we could cut our healthcare bill by 25%. Imagine what it would mean for our infrastructure, for disposable income, for our overall economic vitality. Imagine what it would mean for our business community not to have this albatross around their neck it would be extraordinary.